Uh, Ed Harrison here for Real Vision. I have the distinct pleasure of speaking to Azim Azar, who is a writer, technologist, and he's also the creator of the acclaimed Exponential View newsletter. Welcome to Real Vision, Azim. Thank you so much uh, for having me, Ed. I appreciate it. You know, I'm really excited to talk to you because you do have an upcoming book uh, called Exponential. We're going to get into that in a little bit. And this is part of a series of interviews that we're doing here at Real Vision on the exponential age. So you're exactly the right person to talk to who's been looking at this. You're looking at this from a number of different views. You know, I, I was saying that you are a a writer. You're also a technologist and a entrepreneur. Maybe you can give our audience a little bit of a background into your technology and and journalism uh, stakes. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. In a way, I'm a child of the uh, the microprocessor revolution because I was born the year after the Intel 4004 processor was released, uh, which was uh, back in 71. And you know, I grew up with a computer in the home from the age of uh, nine. Uh, and so I still have that computer, uh, by the way, and it still works just about. So I was one of those lucky kids who just happened along at the right period of time, in the right place. I went to a junior school where there was one guy who bought us a one teacher who bought a computer in one day and it stayed in the school. And when I got to university, um, I discovered the internet in about 1991. And that had me absolutely hooked. Uh, and so my journey, and I talk a little bit about this, has uh, of my professional career has followed in a way the growth of the tech industry uh, with the process, microprocessor, personal computing, and then and then the internet. And the funny thing is that, you know, in those early days, nobody was really um, on the internet. I mean, I remember sending emails back and forth to the people who defined the mail protocol that everyone's emails run, runs over, SMTP, and then replying to me while I was a university student, because you just did. I, I emailed a, a guy called Mark Andreessen in 94 because there was a bug in a web browser he had uh, written, and he replied to me really politely within 10 minutes. And of course, you, you don't know. You're just the lucky kid who's around at the same period of time and and that is where the bug for all of this this bit me, um, and, you know. In and in those days, it was really primordial. Ed. I don't think people can can quite remember, but when I launched uh, the websites for the Guardian newspaper in 1996, I was physically the switch for the internet cable between our servers. So when the traffic got too heavy, I would physically disconnect a cable from one server and plug it into another server, and I would reboot the other server. And in 20 minutes, I would do that again. And I sat in this equipment room doing this for the whole of the afternoon when load was too high. And that's what you had to do back then. And uh, I had a chance in the first couple of chapters of my book to reflect on how rapidly exponential technologies change and reflect on some of the funny experiences I had in my life. Wow, that is amazing. I think those are some great anecdotes. So, I mean, obviously you've seen the uh, exponential age, so to speak, uh, from the beginning of the internet to where we are today. I mean, I, I think technologists in general have been talking about exponential um, things happening for a long time. How different is what's going on right now? Uh, with uh, new technologies converging with crypto uh, in this space versus, say, the internet bubble. Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video. I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important. Is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. Is what's going on right now uh, with uh, new technologies converging with crypto uh, in this space versus, say, the internet bubble. You know, I worked at Yahoo during the internet bubble. Right. Uh, you, I know that you uh, were in that space at the same time. Right. 
uh, you know, how more exponential are we today? Is it just hype? Well, I, I you know, I think having lived through the uh, the dot com bubble like you did, and you know, investing at exactly the wrong time, uh, like uh, like many other people did, you know, I know the pain of of bubbles, uh, you know, but I spent a lot of time trying to understand what's really going on here, and. There are there are a, a few reasons why things are different now, kind of fundamentally different. The first is that uh, the computer industry was a harbinger. It was a precedent for indus- industrial technologies that are very general purpose that can improve at exponential rates. And it demonstrated to us what that exponential improvement does. What it does is it dramatically drives down prices. And as prices drive down, we use much more of the compute because we use much more of it. Complementary businesses emerge around that. And so the distinction between where we are today and where we were 20 years ago, let alone 30 years ago when I first got on the internet, is that there is an entire stack of uh, on which these innovations now expand and 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 explode you know back at the the rate with which facebook grew in 2005 to 2006 was unprecedented and now if you grew as fast as that um in a with a new consumer app you'd be a bit of a disappointment because you have to grow as fast as tiktok or faster so so that has happened that dynamic um, which is that the the core infrastructures of, of exponentiality have been laid down. We all have smartphones. There's unlimited compute in the cloud. There's multi-megabit and gigabit connections to people's homes. Means that businesses can grow, no questions asked. B- back in, in 2000, I invested in an online real estate business in France called Un de Trois Imo. And not only did we discover that most of the buyers, the consumers, not have PCs or internet connections. Most of the realtors didn't. So to even get them started on this on-ramp, we had to buy them a PC and get them an internet connection and teach them uh, what, how to use it. So that was difficult. That, that problem has gone away. Now, we established that idea within the computing industry. Prices come down, demand goes up, complementary businesses emerge, the infrastructure gets built. You don't, now don't have to ask buy your realtor a a PC or a mobile phone to deliver them a digital service. They have one. But now in the exponential age, and that incidentally is the title of my book in the US is the exponential age. So if you're American viewers, look for it on Amazon. That's what they have to look for. There are three other technology platforms that have similar dynamics. The platform of synthetic biology, which is bringing genomics and protein engineering together with the tools of the technology industry. There is the the general purpose technologies of renewable energy, like wind and solar and lithium ion batteries, which are transforming the energy system. And then there are the manufacturing techniques of additive manufacturing, which are allowing us to print everything from meat to cement to lightweight titanium to wood. Each of those three general purpose technologies are on a similar exponential march, the one that we saw silicon go on between the 1960s and it is still going on now. So so that's why I say the computer industry is a harbinger for all of of this. The next three platforms will do similar things and we sort of understand some of the dynamics. And that's why I think now we are, I mean, I, I, I argue in the book that it's between about 2013 and 2017 that we realize this, entering a new socioeconomic industrial paradigm, which I call the exponential age. Yes, you know, and I had to take notes as you were saying oh. that because uh, <laughs> there, there was so much to unpack there. Yeah. And, but you know, before we move forward with all of that, yeah. let's, uh, let me just go backwards for a second because yeah. I think I've seen something where you talked about uh, technology uh, becoming ever increasing. Maybe we can just to give people a sense of how different today is versus the the past. There was something where you were talking about the Malthusian problem uh, through to the industrial revolution. And then now it's sort of like a, a second, third, fourth industrial revolution. Maybe you can walk us through the history of technology from a longer term historical perspective. Yeah, I know I'd love to do that. And, you know, I want to apologize to viewers because um, 
uh, Ed and I have known each other for a long time and we haven't had a chance to speak much. And I've just finished this book and I'm really excited. So I'm <laughs> put up with the excitement. Uh, so, you know, if we think about humans' relationship with, with technology, uh, there are a couple of things that are important. One is that technology has a purpose. You know, we we have an itch to scratch. And, and it may be that we're feeling a bit lazy about having to go out and, uh, you know, fish with our hands, back go back 50,000 years. So we kind of figure out how to jerry-rig a, a net or a spear or something. Um, the, the second is that technologies tend to be a little bit um, ecological and evolutionary. They don't emerge uh, appear from nowhere they're not like a sort of a gift from the gods they happen through an interaction of what's gone before and what's important in our societies and in our our cultures and they have fundamental impacts then in the in the ways we we live one of my favorite ideas is that if you look at the the, the length of the digestive tract of a human uh, and you compare it to that of one of our hominid ans uh, relations, we actually have a much shorter digestive tract because we outsourced part of our digestion to flint axes. So when we were on the veldt in the plains and the Rift Valley two million years ago, whereas our chimp cousins were chewing bark and plants and having to digest it within their bodies, we chopped it up and macerated it with a flint. And as a consequence, our bodies needed to, to have a less robust digestive system. So for a long time, and I'm not sure if this is what you meant by history, technology and humans have had this relationship where it's connected to a purpose, a goal we're trying to achieve. It, it, influences, it is influenced by what we need to do and what's around us, and it fundamentally influences us. And we can take that forward to technologies like the printing press, which people think of as a printing press coming around and increasing literacy. What they did, the printing press did, was it dropped the price of books. The salaries of professors in Italy rose in the 15th century. Literacy rose. The Reformation came along. Science was born. The Catholic Church lost its power. But the other interesting thing about the printing press, and I know viewers of Real Vision will appreciate this, is that the, the group of men who came around the printing press represent one of the first for-profit capitalist enterprises where people took risk shares in the success of this project. So the knock-on effects are, are, are very, very powerful into society more widely. And we've seen that back from 2 million years ago through to the 1470s. And we see it through the Industrial Revolution. We see it through the arrival of the car, the telephone, and electricity at the start of the 20th century. And now we'll see the same thing in the exponential age. Yeah, that is fascinating. And it seems that, you know, uh, the premise is that uh, we're rising. These things are coming together in, a, in an exponential way, meaning that... Uh, they're coming together in ways that uh, enhance one another. And let me let me read to you how your book is uh, touted on the internet uh, that's coming up. Um, this is what they say, uh, Azim. They say, an exponential, Azar, uh, shows how this exponential gap, this is a, a gap that you can explain um, between the power of new technology and humans' ability to keep up, uh, he explains how this exponential gap uh, becomes our society's most pressing problem. The gulf between established businesses and fast-growing digital platforms, the inability of nation states to deal with new forms of cyber warfare, and the sclerotic response of liberal democracies to fast-moving social problems. So I, this is where I want to go. I want to go to A the uh what you know what are these technologies and then b that whole uh paradigm from a social perspective because people they're interested in the whiz bang of the technology right we're also interested in how do we cope with this uh what does it mean for our society what does it mean for the politics the challenge is that we tend to we can focus on the uh, the, the breakthroughs that the technologies can, can make because we can see them more easily, uh, but we don't necessarily appreciate how it's going to have its second or third order effects in society. Uh, one interesting example of this is that when uh, 
Americans started to buy iPhones uh, about a decade ago, uh, they, they bought more and more of them. And the sales of chewing gum uh, started to collapse. And the argument was that when people were at the front of the the, the, the checkout at the um, uh, you know the, the the gas station or the the mini mart, they were no longer paying attention and grabbing the chewing gum from the bin. They were staring at their phones, uh, and so you have these strange uh, impacts that you can't predict up up ahead. Now, the, what's happening today is that the rate of change of technology is so fast. And the rate of diffusion of that technology in the industry in, and then into our economies and into our daily lives is also very, very fast. And I explain why those things are related and why we actually see uh, you know, the, the rate with which a new idea comes and spreads uh, increase. And it's partly because of the internet, it's partly because of global supply chains, but essentially if there's a trend in Shanghai on Wednesday, It'll be in San Francisco on Thursday and Stockholm on Friday. And we have the, this universal access device that means that we all get access to it. So what that means is that the disruptive potential of the technology mirrors that exponential curve of the underlying capabilities of the technology. But that's only half of the picture. The other half of the picture is the rest of the world in which we live, and those are complicated institutions. Some of those institutions are very formal. They're like the beautiful Capitol building in Washington, which is not only a physical institution, it's got people and rules. And some of them are much more you know, informal. They're just habits and norms and conventions. But social scientists tell us that institutions adjust slowly at the best of times. And so partly because that's why they're designed, that's institute sort of has that sense of solidity of standing there. And, and so the exponential gap is what happens when linear institutions that are used to not changing quickly or not changing at all, meet the reality of technologies and the products and services that are built on them that can move at an exponentially increasing rate. So let's attack this uh, from uh, one lens. I want to talk, you, you mentioned before capitalism and uh, companies. Uh, maybe we can attack this via the company, uh, the companies within the exponential age. How do you look at these companies? How do they compete? What are the most salient things that we should take away from companies, technology companies and uh, incumbent non-technology companies? Yeah, I think that's a really important and fascinating area. So the, the argument about the, the exponential gap is that the technologies create new possibilities and new ways of operating and uh, really fundamental new mechanisms and methods. And so they break our old institutional thinking. In the, co in this, the case of economies and dynamic economies, one of the traditional forms of thinking is that you have diminishing marginal returns, that the nature of running an industrial organization is that it gets harder to get bigger beyond a certain point. So you get some scale benefits, and then organizational complexity gets in the way, and then it's just really expensive to mine the one million and one-th ton of coal compared to the one million or compared to the hundred thousandth. And so you have this, um, this world which is governed by uh, the, the, the economics of Marshall on one hand and diminishing returns and uh, Ronald Coe's organizational complexity on the other that says that, you know, our assumption is that companies can't really get too big in terms of their market share. And if they do, they must have done something dodgy. Right. Standard standard oil, right? They become right. monopolists. And so we then intervene at that point because they're misbehaving. My argument is that within the exponential age, companies rely on uh, becoming platforms and platforms have network effects. Network effects meaning that every additional customer adds value to all the previous customers that you've had. They also benefit from the extensive use of intangible assets. Uh, and intangible assets are, are also um, assets which tend to um, 
accrete disproportionately to anyone who has an early advantage. And then when you're applying AI, which is a core exponential technology to all of this, um, AI is an incredible perpetual motion machine because AI depends on data, but in it, but in using that data, it generates more data to get to get stronger. So you have platforms, network effects, intangibles, and the AI data network effect, and all of these break the force of gravity of martial econ economics and co's to mean that the, 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 the standard state of nature for an exponential age company is to grow very large, become a superstar, and dominate its market sector. And, and the, the, the exponential gap that exists is that that's not how we thought competitive e economies would ever work. And so I, I think that even if we look at these superstar companies like a Facebook or a Google, and we find that there are bad business behaviors that we might not like, and they may lose court cases here or there. I think that their general state of nature, even if they had been, you know, whiter than white and cleaner than clean and so on, would have been to trend to dominant market shares. And that means that we need new rules if we want to have vigorous competitive dynamic markets. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that's right where the institutions and regulatory, the regulatory framework meets, uh, you know, the uh, this this new exponential age. Let's dig a little deeper on that, because yeah, and I'm thinking about it from a valuation perspective. You mentioned Facebook and Google, but there are other companies elsewhere in China, uh, Tencent, Alibaba and, uh, you know, Salesforce, Apple. The question for me, from a valuation perspective, is Apple's a $2 trillion company. Based on what you just said, it sounds to me like they could become a 3 or $5 trillion company. And this whole notion that uh, the bigger they get, there's, you know, they can't get that much bigger isn't necessarily true. So my question is, is, uh, you know, $2 million uh, or sorry, two trillion, three trillion, five trillion. What's the impediment to that happening? I mean, is that the right way to look at it? I think it is the right way to look at it. I think that the if you look at an an Apple or a Google, uh, and you say there's no regulatory intervention at all, uh, the question is what would what would actually get in the way of them continuing to to expand, and the things that got in the way of companies earlier, for example organizational complexity. We can't run teams as big as this. They seem to have really got a handle on because they're still growing at 20, 25% per annum, even though they're huge companies. Um, the other thing that gets in the way is what are my choices of expansion uh, vertically or horizontally? Well, these companies are proving they're incredibly adept at vertical expansion. Apple is making its own chips and Apple makes its own TV shows. Um, they're also demonstrating that they can expand horizontally into adjacent and even far adjacent markets. So, you know, Apple's a computer company, and yet its headphones line of business, AirPods, is bigger than most other companies in the world. And it doesn't seem to have problems in expanding horizontally. And it's as true uh, as we might, as we, when we look at a Microsoft or an Amazon or a Google. So, I think that these companies have demonstrated that there is something about the essence of having that exponential age DNA that allows them to rewrite the traditional rules of business uh, that are sort of stuck on that linear institutional path. Right. Yes. And, you know, you mentioned four effects that allow them to get there. Um, there, there are two tracks that I want to talk about. One is the, the new areas that you mentioned earlier. You talked about synthetic uh, biology, renewables, manufacturing technologies. Those are three different places that we can go. But I want to think about, you know, uh, first I want to talk about the four things that are coming together, not just for those areas, but the existing technological improvements in the exponential age. So first and foremost, in my mind, is network effects. When you talk about that, I'm almost thinking winner take all. Um, what is going on with network effects that means that these companies can grow and grow and grow, whereas before they couldn't? Yeah, it's a really, um, it's a really important uh, question. Um, so, 
you know, the, the network effect uh, simply is that uh, every additional customer adds value to every other customer. And so what does that, that actually mean? Well, you turn it around the other way, is that if I'm a customer thinking about making a business cho uh, a choice and one supplier has network effects and the other hasn't, by joining the supplier with network effects, I will benefit from the existing network effects and all future success that they have. And so when I make a customer choice, I will generally choose the company that has those network effects. And you know, Microsoft in the 80s was the, the, the sort of great example of that because as they got a bigger a user base, more developers moved on to Microsoft because there was a bigger market to sell the software, which meant they had better software, which choices, which brought more users. So that's the dynamic of the, the network effect. Now, the question is, in order to do that, you have to have a platform of some sort. Um, and a, a platform essentially is a bit like a marketplace where people can, can, can come and go. You know, if you want to buy shares in US companies, you're better off going to the NASDAQ, which is a marketplace where everybody lives, than coming to my backyard where I've got a, you know, a handful of ETFs that I could sell you a couple of shares of, right? You know, you go where the liquidity is. And, and the funny sort of way, uh, the platform business model enables network effects in industries that we hadn't thought there would be. So if you think about you know, Uber or Airbnb, there are network effects existing in the kind of the, the taxi business or in the, uh, the, the, the hotel business. But my favorite example of how you can create these network effects on a platform and redefine a traditional business is in the, the, the area of agricultural machinery. Who would have thought it? But John Deere, and I'm sure there are Real Vision viewers who bought John Deere stock five years ago and are very happy for it. Uh, John Deere, about five or six years ago, said, we're not just going to make uh, combine harvesters and tractors. We are going to become a platform. And by becoming a platform where third parties can plug into my John Deere and therefore farmers can access this array of services, we will create a new chokehold, that's the, which is access, and we will enjoy network effects. And they demonstrated that you could deliver those network effects in a much more traditional business, provided you became a platform. And the consequence of that is, you know, maybe it's not as strong as winner take all, maybe it's more like winner take most, but if you look at lots and lots of markets, you see winner take most, um, even in online travel, where the booking.com group uh, is the you know, far and away dominant uh, space there. So across all of these different um, industries, you, you get this uh, winner-take-all phenomenon. And a large part of it is driven by a network effect enabled by a platform. You know, you mentioned something about AI that I found very fascinating. Uh, I'm thinking about this from an Amazon perspective. Uh, I'll give you the example um, you, you, when we're talking about data. So I go to Amazon. Uh, they're the, the seller uh, uh, that has the network effects. So I'm thinking this this company must have this item that I'm looking for because, you know, that's that's why I'm going there, you know, because of the network effects. Then I type in what I'm looking for and Amazon auto completes what I'm, what I type in. Right. When I click on the auto completion, it pops up with a bunch of different stuff for me to look through. None of those things are actually what I'm looking for. It's because Amazon knows because of the AI that people like me are looking for this item and that they're more likely to make a sale of items that they actually have that are similar to this item. And as a result, they display those items as opposed to the item that I'm looking for. They don't display, we don't have this item. They, they display a bunch of other items right. that I would potentially buy. And yeah. lo and behold, you know, maybe five times out of 10, I will buy that item. And so Amazon makes the sale. That's how I'm thinking about AI. Maybe you can give us the, the sort of like macro picture of how that data uh, works. Yeah, I mean, you've you've put your finger on a really great example, uh, on a great example there. I mean, essentially, uh, you know, what's happening with within Amazon is that uh, as as I come and search for things and then choose to buy them or choose not to buy them, it creates a data stream. As you do the same thing, it creates a similar data stream. It may notice that when I search for um, 
a 40 pound kettlebell, uh, it will, uh, I'm quite likely to go off and then buy, uh, you know, a, a, a bunch of protein powder. And so when you come and search for a 40 pound uh, kettlebell, in your case, a 48 pound kettlebell, I know, Ed, um, <laughs> it, it will recommend uh, protein powder. And that's it in its basic. But you have to think that there are hundreds of millions of people doing this for over decades now in Amazon's case. So that their ability to therefore figure out what you might buy next is unparalleled. But you've actually touched on one of the slightly trickier issues of their of their business, which which speaks to the problem of competitive uh, markets, right? And as investors, we need to see competitive markets because we have to have choices about where we allocate our capital. And part of the challenge that has started to emerge is that Amazon is in a sense on both sides of the trade because it sees the flow, it sees the things that you search for and what choices you make. You know, when you search for uh, batteries for your remote control, TV remote control, it figures out what words appeal to you in the batteries you buy and what price point matters and what packaging size matters. And one of the accusations is that Amazon uses that information to then build its own brand products, right? And this has been documented by a number of the very well-known financial p uh, papers in the United States. And, and the question is, does that have a stultifying effect on dynamic markets? Now, of course, retailers have always done this, right? They've always used their, their knowledge of footfall to figure out what own brand products to produce and that, you know, own brand products have got higher margins than, you know, when you, when you go off and you get a name brand. But that tension has always been there, but those markets have never been as concentrated. They've never, never suffered from winner take most, uh, which these current uh, markets seem to. So I, I think, you know, the Amazon story is a great story about AI, but it's also a great story about how we might have to have new ways of thinking about what it means to operate well and competitively in an economy. Yes, definitely. And I think that, you know, the nuance there is how do you take a regulatory approach there uh, without while still understanding that it's it's winner take most. And yeah. that, to yeah. me, the question is, is what does winner take most mean from a data perspective, an AI perspective? I'll use Google since we're talking about search. You know, how many competitors, what, what's the percentage of the most that Google should be able to take? How do and how should regulators deal with the fact that Google's get seen all the flow from from search? So their technology, their AI should make their search uh, demonstrably better than others. What percentage of the market uh, accretes to Google as a result of that? I think that's a really um, important question. And that takes us back to um, uh, an idea that's a little bit, bit been forgotten about, which is the idea of a natural monopoly. Uh, and from a natural monopoly, essentially saying that you know, how many sewage systems does any one town really need? You know, do you really want competition amongst the sewage networks? Uh, or would you rather say this is infrastructure, it should be run once, and therefore it should be, as its infrastructure, be considered like an essential provision to that, to that municipality? And we as regulators should say, listen, you can't pr price gouge with an essential facility, right? It's just gotta be there. And once you've built it, you've got this unassailable lead. Um, so I think that there are things that we can learn from utility regulation. And I'm, I'm not saying take utility regulation and bring it into these markets. I'm saying, look at utility regulation, be inspired and figure out where it makes sense. Um, so, so the way that you might then tackle something like Google search is start to say, um, you know, some parts of what you've built are really, um, unassailable, and you've made a fantastic return for your shareholders from that over the last 25 years. But increasingly, because you are, you're, it's creating some stultification in the market, we need to change your obligations, your societal obligations when you provide that search. And I'll, I'll give your viewers an example of something that's happened in the, the UK around this. So of course, broadband infrastructure is really important to, to roll out. But rolling out broadband and digging up all the streets and the sidewalks and so on is expensive. So a few years ago, the telecoms regulator said to BT, which is our national provider, said, listen, 
in order to have a competitive market, we are going to have to split your business. And the lower layer, the bit that runs the ducts and the pipes in the streets and does the backhaul, that is going to have to be treated as a utility. And you're going to have to offer access to that fairly to all your competitors and yourself. Um, but the rest of you can be as aggressive and competitive and capitalistic as you want. And, you know, of course, there was a bit of uh, argument about that. But it's actually ended up working quite well as a kind of a mechanism of saying there's some part of your business now that has become something that is too essential for us, for our economic vibrancy and for dynamism. And we need that to be pegged and treated slightly differently as the spicier part of your business. No, you know, I want to uh, look at how this works in some of the newer technology areas where exponential activity is happening. The first area that you mentioned when we were talking about this earlier is the place that people are thinking about the most right now, because you and I, we're in our homes, yeah. you know, uh, miles away from each other. Who knows? It, uh, a year and a half ago, I would have uh, gotten on a plane and interviewed right. you in the UK, but now we're doing it technologically. And by the way, I like your background because it it, gr it glows green every once in a while, which <laughs> which I find really nice. Yeah. The the thing is, is synthetic biology. You talked about that. Uh, as an area to watch. This is uh, biology, it's synthetic biology is something that we care about with the vaccines and everything that's going on there. Maybe you can talk about why this is one of the looking, one of the places to look for exponential trends in technology. Yeah, it's, you know, it's such an incredible, uh, incredible area, what's what's going on here. And obviously, we've enjoyed it from, from the vaccine uh, benefits. There, there are two different things that we should think about, right? What is, what is, one is, pardon me, one is, what is the demand side opportunity? Uh, and the second is, can we deliver on it? And the demand side opportunity is absolutely huge, because as we decarbonize our economies, we're going to need to be able to produce a lot of materials that are currently petro derivatives. So a lot of plastics, a lot of pharmaceuticals, right? They're all um, refinery byproducts, and, and we produce them by controlled explosions on refineries uh, around the world. Um, and what we can start to do in synthetic biology is look at what nature does and figure out how to produce those. So for example, you genetically modify a type of microorganism, a yeast, and you can get it to brew sheets of film that replace plastic on smartphone covers. And they have higher performance characteristics zero carbon footprint. And that's well, that's one area for this new bioeconomy. So the demand side of that is absolutely enormous. And of course, we've seen the demand for mRNA vaccines is going to be 7.5 billion people around the planet, which is as big as it gets. On the supply side, why is this happening? It's happening because there are some biological techniques, uh, the uh, mRNA uh, platform being one, but also genomic sequencing uh, being another, that lend themselves to exponential price improvements. Um, and if you look at genome sequencing, when we first um, uh, sequenced a human genome, back when you were probably working for Yahoo about 20 years ago, it cost about three, between 300 million and a billion dollars to sequence that first genome. Um, as of the start of this year, BGI, which is an outfit in, in China, reckoned it was going to cost them $100 to sequence a human genome. And so genome sequencing pricing has declined much, much faster than computer chip pricing. And it's one reason, by the way, why we were able to sequence the uh, uh, coronavirus uh, virion so quickly, because we just had sequences everywhere because the prices had come down. So you have the same dynamic of rapidly, rapidly declining prices. And essentially, that has meant also that biology has been turned into information. And so it takes advantage of all the benefits of Moore's law and computation and artificial intelligence. So you combine those dramatic price declines with the huge demand that we have for novel drugs and replacing petroderivatives and materials and so on. And I think you get one of the most fascinating uh, industrial sectors uh, over the next 20 years. 
Yes, definitely. And, and uh, you know, it was interesting that in that uh, response, almost right at the start, you uh, sort of um, moved into yet another area that I wanted to uh, talk about. I mean, you talked about uh, manufacturing a case uh, that's, in, that's essentially like plastic, but better because, you know, zero carbon emissions. Suddenly now we're going from synthetic biology to renewables. And that's the second area that you think that there are exponential trends in place uh, to go forward. I know that Rao Powell, who's our CEO, he talks about renewables. He talks about how uh, Europe in particular, from a, a corporate perspective, is perhaps uh, going to really drive uh, forward on that. What about the technology behind it, the exponential nature of that drive forward? Why is it that renewables are exponential at all? Yeah, it's so weird. <laughs> Why would they be? <laughs> so the first is that um, the reason prices decline is, um, is because of learning. So the more an industry figures out how to do something, every incremental uh, unit uh, costs less because they embed their knowledge in more efficient manufacturing. So this is not because they're buying more inputs, it's just that they're better at making, making them. And that's a kind of critical pulse of exponential price declines. When you look at solar, for example, um, solar panel manufacturing is really all about um, a 2D substrate on which you have to array a set of circuits. And that's a very similar set of disciplines to making a computer chip, which is basically a silicon wafer with a bunch of circuits on there. So we can kind of understand by analogy, and sometimes by direct transfer, why the things that worked in Moore's law should also work on, on solar panels. Um, and so we've seen solar panel price declines um, that are just really, um, uh, you know, out of this world. And now solar uh, contract utility solar prices are approaching kind of one and a quarter, one and a half cents per kilowatt hour, which is remarkable. It's it's slightly stranger when you think about wind turbines, because wind turbines are these really big physical things. I mean, they're like the sort of cruise ship size, right? 200 meters high and so on and so forth. Why would they have um, exponential improvements? So partly it's because of these, these learning effects that I talked about. But the second is this really nice uh, idea, which is that the amount of power a wind turbine generates is related to the radi the area that the blades sweep through. And the area is a function of the square of the radius. So every extra 10% that you get on the length of a blade, you'll get about 21% extra generating capacity power. And that is a nonlinear relationship. And it's part of the reason why, as we make these sort of linear improvements in the kind of underlying capabilities of wind turbines, we get this nonlinear improvement in their, their output. And so even though they're, they're sort of big and heavy and need lubricants and so on, um, we're also seeing wind uh, prices decline uh, exponentially. Uh, and that's pretty uh, remarkable. It's not the rate of Moore's law. I use the definition for exponential technologies as... 10% price performance improvement every year over a sustained period of time or better. In, in wind and solar, it's between about 20 and 30% per year. In computer chips, it's between about 45 and 60% a year, but they're all still exponential technologies. Yeah, that is interesting. Now, the question is, uh, you know, when you said the one, I was thinking 1.1 times 1.1 is 1.21. That's where the 10 becomes 21%. Yeah, that's right. Um, does that mean that you need to have a bigger and bigger uh, uh, wind turbine, or how does that work in in practice? Well, we're already building bigger uh, wind wind turbines, and over the last twenty years, um, wind turbine sizes sizes have really really expanded. I think the largest blades now are in excess of eighty meters, uh, eighty eight yards in um, in, in radius. Um, so they they are getting bigger and bigger. But actually, I don't think wind is just a game of huge size of individual turbines, although that helps. Um, it's also actually just about being, being able to leverage the capital and build you know, bigger and bigger offshore 
uh, wind farms. Uh, and, you know, just before I came on, uh, we came on to do this recording, I read that uh, there's a contract in South Korea now that's approaching uh, $40 billion to build the world's largest um, offshore wind farm. And the thing to think about this is that once you've installed, the, you've, you've put up that upfront cost, of course, your electricity, roughly speaking, runs for free. I mean, there's mechanical maintenance that has to happen, but it's very, very different to the kind of maintenance you need and refueling that you need in a, in a fossil fuel system. Yeah. And, you know, right at the beginning of that, when we were talking about the solar part, you were talking about uh, this is similar to a silicon uh, type of uh, production uh, in terms of the exponential uh, part of it. It makes me think about manufacturing technologies. That's the third area that you were saying where we were having exponential growth technologically. This isn't just about uh, you know silicon wafers and solar, but other ma manufacturing technologies. What other manufacturing technologies and how is it similar to what we've seen in in uh, what we've seen in Moore's law, which yeah. is uh, you know Gordon Moore of of Intel. Mm. Yeah, so the, the, the this final area is um, often known as 3D printing or additive manufacturing. And we've got a number of ways of making things. We can do what um, uh, Michelangelo did, which is we can take a big block of mar marble and we can chip away at it and we're left with whatever's left. Um, or we can... Um, uh, use a cast or a mold to pour molten plastic or molten steel into something and mold, you know, the cup or the knife that we want. Um, or we can build something and additively layer by layer using clay for sake of argument. Um, and additive manufacturing now is being computer controlled. And, and the, the power of that additive um, added man manufacturing is that you can actually create structures that you can't create through casting and molding, and you can't create through um, uh, subtractive manufacturing, that is chiseling away or, or using a plane or something. Uh, and the, the, the value of that is that you can build lighter, more flexible, but also stronger type of components. And so additive manufacturing has taken off in aerospace and in automotive and in you know, medical implants uh, where uh, you, know, you can afford to pay extra. If you drive the BMW i8, which was their high-end sports car, uh, it had a 3D printed part in the, in the retractable roof. Of course, it's super expensive now, but so were computers in 1974. Uh, but th there's a suite of additive manufacturing technologies, and they are all on average, improving on a price performance basis at about 30% per annum. That is, you know, roughly performance is what we care about is speed and accuracy, sort of pixel resolution or, or, or printing resolution, um, and the variety of materials they can use. Uh, and there's just some really impressive breakthroughs. So what we would expect is a typical exponential pattern, which is slow and boring for a while. And then at some point, it'll get cheap enough and diverse enough as a technology that it will take off. And, and we just, we've just seen in the last um, week or two, uh, a desktop metal, which I think is a listed um, company in the 3D printing additive manufacturing space, demonstrated 3D printing with wood, and it produces these incredibly beautiful, organic looking designs that we would have been impossible to build uh, just 10 years ago in any in any way, shape or form. The fascinating thing is, is the numbers behind that, because as you were speaking, I, I wasn't thinking about the cost reduction in terms of division. I was thinking about multiplication, you know, because we, we went through the example of 10 percent. So if you take something and you uh, increase by 10 percent, you get to 1.1, then you get to 1.21, then you get to 1.331. But if you take something 30% and then you exponential that, you go from 1 to 1.3 to 1.69 to 2.197. I mean, the the differential between, you know, over time is massive in terms of that. Maybe you can talk as someone who's like a technologist and obviously probably math literate. I used to be a, a math guy back in the yeah. day. The, just getting your head wrapped around this whole, I mean, exponents, it, it's yeah. uh, its massive differentials just from 
you know, that little example that I gave. It's incredibly hard to get your your head around it. And uh, we we started to, to think about how difficult it was uh, back in the 19, late 1960s and the early 1970s. Albert Bartlett was an a pro- energy professor, physics professor um, out of the US who regularly put, tried to teach people the difficulty uh, of the exponential function. And the rough rule is that if you have a gro- particular growth rate, and you divide 70 by that number, that's a number of years it'll take to double. So if you've got a growth rate of 7%, which is a little bit worse than the average stock market return, that means that 70 divided by seven is 10. Every 10 years, your thing will double. If your growth rate or improvement rate is 35%, that means it doubles every two years. So after two years, it's doubled. After four years, it's quadrupled. Uh, after six years, it's gone eight, up eightfold, and it very rapidly gets out of proportion. Our brains are not wired to contend with this rate of, of change. If you can contend with this rate of change, then you stand a, a chance of doing really, really well uh, economically. I'll give you an example. I was an investor in, a, in an AI company back in 2005, and you know the numbers were not appealing, like the amount of computation they needed was just really crazy. And I said to the the founder, uh, a guy called Barney Pell, I said, "Uh, Barney, just talk to me about these costs, because, you know, they're really high, (laughs) like your server costs are really high today. He goes, what's going to happen long term, right? How does this turn into something? And he just said to me, three words, uh, pardon me, four words. Well, duh, Moore's Law. (laughs) Uh, which you referred to earlier. His point being that he could look at this and every year know that that line item was going to decline by 50% because that was the gift that kept giving, which was exponential technology improvement. And and as a consequence, investors in his company did very well. Um, And so I think that grappling with the exponential function, this rate of change, is something that we all need to get better at doing. And the coronavirus pandemic, I think was a great example of this. Um, You know, people looked at this, I remember saying to people in in March, uh, late February, stay at home. And they're they're beginning, but there are only two cases. And I'm like, yeah, but this is an ex, you know, virus spread is exponential. (laughs) There's going to be a lot of cases. Um, We find it really hard. Um, Evolutionarily, we're not wired to see it because we've never had to experience exponential uh, processes in nature. They, they don't exist at our scale. Uh, and so as a, as a result, our brains are not wired to contend with them. If our brains aren't wired to contend with them, then, uh, you know, as you uh, as the touting of your book points out, uh, the exponential gap can explain our society's most pressing problems. It, it, it just goes right to the, the social problems. We're talking about exponential change in a, a linear uh, mind uh, with institutions, as you said, that are linear, uh, what what are the most important things to think about in terms of what that, what that means um, for our institutions? Not just, I'm thinking about regulatory institutions, I'm talking about, I don't want this. That, that's the first thing that someone would say is, is that, you know, wait a minute, slow down. That's too much change. Let's roll this back in some way. I liked it how it was before. Stop <laughs> yeah. doing these things. What, what do we do about that uh, urge? Yeah, it's really it's a really challenging one. So, um, you know, I think that there's there are some aspects of this underlying process that are hard to avoid because they are not top down. It's not anointed by Silicon Valley tech gods that this has to happen. It's actually every single one of us um, acting in concert in the market um, prefers the shorter route. They prefer the thing to be more seamless. And that sends a signal back into the market to develop in this way. Uh, And so we are, I think, on a path that continues this rapid pace of development. And in many cases, we want it, right? We want to avoid the the worst parts of climate change. So we really do want renewables to improve exponentially. And we really do want synthetic biology to come on stream at scale quickly in order to protect wealth and livelihoods and quality of life while maintaining our, our environment. So we want this exponentiality. I think the challenge has been that technology has developed too far away 
from ordinary society and where the de where democracy and decision making take place. Um, and part of the reason was that actually it was commercially expedient for technologists in the 80s and the 90s and, and the 2000s to present themselves as special uh, because that would allow them the, 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 the headroom to build these enormous companies without much oversight. Um, and the, the thing is that technologies don't just shape culture, they're shaped by the culture around it. And, and so part of my plea is, and it's a book that can be read by uh, technologists and investors and policymakers, is to create that bridge but to, to give the technologists that sort of empathetic understanding of the impact of their technologies in the economy and society, and to give in the, the rest of us a better understanding of the underlying processes of the technology. And to be very clear that while we might struggle to contain every aspect of the pace of change, we can certainly play a role in shaping the direction and pointing that change in ways that we all think might be a little bit more beneficial. Let me give you some specific examples, because I think that's good from a generic perspective. I want to drill down. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this, but there is a, um, in the United States, there is a chart that shows uh, productivity gains going like this over a 50 year period, you know, and, and the slope of the line is pretty constant. Uh, when you look at uh, real incomes, real, uh, you know, for the median wage earner, it also goes like this uh, up until, say, the mid 70s. And then suddenly it, it flattens out almost entirely. Um, I would say I would posit that a decent amount of that has to do with uh, network effects, uh, winner take most, and technological change. I think about, say, you know, I go to the local grocery store, and half of the checkouts are are automatic. It's technology that's checking me out. It's not a mm -hmm. a, 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 gr a grocery store employee. So that person is therefore not needed, and there's a lot of wage pre downward wage pressure. We're, now we're we're having capital getting a lot of the benefits of technology and labor is not keeping up as we saw with productivity. How do you deal with that from a societal perspective? Because to me, that's where the pitchforks come out. Yeah, yeah, that's the pitchfork risk, right? And uh, it's, a real, it's a real risk, um, a, a societal political risk, a risk for every investor. You know, we need stable democratic societies. They return, make better returns than autocracies or societies driven by civil uh, strife. Um, and, you know, your ti the timing is really fascinating. I do think it is a largely an exponential age dynamic because it, it is between the period of about 1970 and about 2015, where we see an incredible switch in the value um, of corporate um, corporate value valuations, where it shifts from tangible assets that humans make into intangible assets that we can't really put our hands on. And it's related to the declining labor share. And I think that one of the historical um, coincidences that it's a, as an accident is that as we started to roll back the regulatory state in the late 60s and early 70s, pegged to the ideas of, of Milton Friedman and the monetarists, we strangely took the brakes off technological development just as technological development started to go exponential. Uh, and so there was a slight um, issue, right? Because that idea of having no limits is really helpful when you're dealing with um, sclerotic industries like the car industry in the 1970s or 80s. But it, it, it's not what you need when you've got a rocket powered tech startup, right? You actually need you actually need the other thing. So I think that there is a moment of reckoning because uh, we will not want this political risk to, uh, to magnify this risk that essentially um, 10 points of national income has moved from labor to capital um, over the last 45 years. It's an enormous amount and the bulk of it really in the last 30. And, and so, so we will, I'm sure, see uh, in a number of countries moves to uh, make, that, make that adjustment. And I really view it as, a, as an adjustment. I think of it in terms of you know, reversion to the mean in some sense. Um, it, it's about saying, um, you know, 
at some stage of the journey, we have to swap our, our bike for our running shoes, right? No one expects you to complete a triathlon uh, in the same, you know, on the same mode, right? And, and so we've, we've enjoyed this moment where we emphasized innovation and entrepreneurship. And, and in that, we've laid the foundations for transforming our economy uh, on this sort of sustainable digital exponential platform but that came um, in, the, in a sense at the cost of broader equity. And now that we've got that platform in place and we can see the massive pitchfork risk that is emerging, we're going to move that dial. And, and I think it, you, you see this idea emerging from other domains. I've come at it from a technologist domain, but I know that economists are approaching it you know, with their own theories. And, and it, we, we, we're seeing a sort of similar picture. Well, you know, uh, when you mentioned the pitchfork risk uh, and uh, the the sh the pendulum swing, I'm thinking about the Great Depression, you know, because that's the perfect example of a pitchfork risk. When you think about it just from a macro perspective, there was a whole period of what I would call government intervention uh, that was uh, dismantled because of the stagflation of the 1970s. So mm -hmm. the pendulum swung the other way. Now we're at a uh, inflection point where, as I said, you have this this curve here, but then you have sort of a, a flattened curve, and that's creating this pitchfork risk again, similar to what we saw, you know, a hundred years ago. The question is, things like UBI, uh, universal basic income, are those going to be the answer? How do you deal with this risk shift? Uh, that we've had over the last 40 years onto labor, um, is it UBI or, or, or how do you think about it? You know, I, I would start by trying to characterize what the, uh, what the problems are and what's needed. So um, in a dynamic moment of change, businesses need flexibility to, to grow fast, to shut down quickly. If things don't work, we're going to ask our, our business people to take risks. Risks means not everything will work out. So they need that flexibility. Um, but on the other hand, we need to also ensure that our that the labor pool has the right level of security. I mean, partly for, for the reasons of political risk, partly because you want workers earning, earning so they can spend and keep the economy dynamic and vibrant. Um, and you also need to ensure that the economy has the skills it needs from the people uh, you know, who are, who are able to work. So maybe UBI is something that works in some countries or some states or some cities. I think what you need is you need to identify the issues and figure out the specific prescription. Um, there's one model that I think has worked well in Western Europe, in Denmark, which is called flex security. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the, the gives and gets. So the employer gives gets flexibility to hire and fire the worker gets security, very, very high unemployment insurance, um, provided that they can demonstrate that they're skilling themselves and, and, and looking for work. Now, it, it, it costs something, right? There's no free lunch here, but it's an interesting balance and it's a prescription that works for their political culture. So I, I think that th those conversations are going to happen differently in different places. There's a group in the US called the Mayors for a Guaranteed Income, uh, includes the mayor of Stockton and a bunch of other cities, and they're running experiments about UBI. I expect we'll see more UBI. I'm not sure we will see UBI universally uh, because there will be other other approaches. But but I think, you know, the fundamental thing is that we can have some agreement about what we need for our societies to function and for our economies to be vibrant. Uh, and once we have that, that agreement, we can figure out policies that specifically tackle them. So I'm going I'm to make a hard shift here, Zim, uh, uh, and go back to exponential trends. And one trend that people talk about a lot that's really dominating the airwaves is crypto. Walk us through how you're thinking about the crypto sector from an exponential view perspective. I think there are there are two really interesting things about about crypto. One is that um, it, for me, it's part of the com the trend of computation uh, that it is uh, developing new classes of uh, methods of doing computing uh, very very rapidly. So of course, 
Uh, there are there are financial specialists who will talk about Bitcoin as a, as a gold alternative and central bank digital currencies and, and so on. But the thing that I find particularly interesting is crypto's ability to provide a new type of uh, computing fabric uh, of a kind that we haven't really seen since the cloud and before that, uh, since personal computers. There's one of the interesting aspects of that is actually crypto's governance capabilities. So when you get involved in a cert certain types of crypto projects as a holder of tokens, you end up getting some kind of governance right. That is, you can vote on the direction that that project takes. Um, and I think that's quite interesting because one of the exponential trends um, it, that, that is a consequence of all this technology change is an increasing importance of decentralization of ec economic activity and localism. Uh, and so there's a nice concordance between crypto as this fabric that provides a new way of computing, but it has baked into it this, this, this notion of governance. In other words, you know, you and I are not simply customers of this service in some sense by buying into it, we also get to shape its, its direction. And I think it's early to say how that will end up uh, playing, playing out. Um, but what we've seen in the last uh, two or three years is that there's real progress being made outside of the incredible price uh, appreciation of so many of these crypto assets. You know, when you talk about incredible price appreciation, the first thing that comes to mind is, uh, you know, bubble, you know, technology, the, the dot com bubble. Uh, let's let's address the elephant in the room. The Federal Reserve, it ha you know, has zero rates. You have negative interest rates throughout Europe and in Japan. Is it possible that we're in the midst of a technology bubble? Well, you know, a bubble is uh, expectations running ahead of reality uh, in in that context. And, I, you know, it, it's, it's possible. Of course, it's possible that um, crypto won't deliver. It's possible that there will be a huge uh, price collapse um, and, and thing, you know, value may, may disappear. But I think that there is, there are some really, really deep fundamentals, particularly around the four general purpose technologies that I talk about, computation, uh, biology, renewables, and, and manufacturing, that are deep, deep, deep fundamental uh, trends that, that stand to ch fundamentally change our ways of life. What happens to assets that are pegged to those trends and, and the rational or irrational exuberance that goes around them is something that I'm I'm not best to, to, to judge. But is there something fundamental happening? I would I would say yes. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, because the question I have is what, you know, let's go back to the dot com bubble. It didn't change the pace of technology, the fact that we had a, a bubble and then it crashed. You know, innovation kept on happening. I mean, what I'm hearing you say is something fundamental is happening and it's going to continue to happen, irrespective of the valuation attached to the assets uh, behind that happening. Yeah, I, I think that's right. But also the difference between now and the dot-com bubble is um, where the hell else is the capital going to go? <laughs> I mean, okay. there's, there's so much more of it because you've got sovereign wealth, you've got Chinese wealth. Um, there, are, there's no, there are no bonds you want to buy. Do you really want to back a company that doesn't have an electric vehicle platform? No, you don't. Do you want to buy a coal field? No, you don't. So you don't have... You, you, you know, as an investor, you don't have any other way to get a return on your assets, really. So that creates, I think, uh, a natural support <laughs> for, for, for prices. Because what am I going to do? Well, I'll take my money out of Tesla and I'll put it in a Swiss bank account where I'll earn minus 0.1%. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's no trade. I'll take the risk on Tesla. Thank you very much. You know, so so I don't know where the cash goes other than, you know, banking on this, um, banking on this future. Yes. Well, I, I'm going to leave it there. I, I think that th those are good answers and uh, give you a chance to tell us, because first of all, when your book is coming out and whether there are pre-orders and where we can find out more about your book. 
Yeah, no, thank you so much. So the book is out in September and you can pre-order it from Amazon uh, if you just search for uh, The Exponential Age uh, by Azim Azar if you're in the US or just Exponential if you're outside of the US. Um, and it's available now. It's actually doing really well. And if you order it from Amazon, uh, you will... Uh, get it the day it comes out or the day or two after it comes out. And you can always find me. I write a weekly newsletter, um, Ed, which is on exponentialview.co or just put Exponential View uh, into Google or Bing or whatever your search engine is, uh, and you'll find me that way. Excellent. Uh, you, you have to promise then, Azim, that when your book comes out in September, that we can have a follow on discussion. I'm sure that I'll have many more questions. Hopefully people will comment and we can make sure that uh, if you decide to come back on, we can an we can ask those questions to you uh, in September. I would love to do that, Ed. I would love to do that. But can it be T-shirts next time? <laughs> yes, definitely. I'm okay. very I'm, I'm down with that. Thank you. Right. Yes. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this special episode of the interview, the premier business and finance series in the world. However, this is just the tip of the iceberg. For more in-depth content and expert analysis, visit the membership link in the description to unlock a week's access for only $1. This dollar can change your life.